That is, there's some evidence that people sometimes reason in a motivated way, and there's sometimes there's evidence that people reason in a more kind of according to the truth. Uh, and that's what the point of this talk is, okay? To basically say which one explains more variance, which is more common, uh, and what context and why, okay? Um, so people make errors uh, when they reason, and this uh, fake news problem that happened uh, or became an issue during the American presidential election 2016, which is when I started my postdoc, um, is a good example of that. So this uh, particular headline uh, drove about a million engagements on Facebook, and it would take each of you probably about 30 seconds to uh, detect that it's false. Either, I mean, using your brain, but you can also just Google it and find that there's lots of reasons to believe that it's, and it was in fact completely fabricated, okay? And so despite this, people still spread a lot of this false content on social media, um, and they could have stopped and thought about it, okay? But we don't know why exactly they made that error. Now, the, the title of the talk is some catchy kind of analogy that I came up with to try to explain this, uh, mostly to lay people, but I'm gonna try it out on you and see what you think. So uh, the question is, why do people make errors, right? Uh, and there are two broad perspectives. Uh, Ellen had touched on these in addition to the other perspective, which is that people just don't know that much. I'm not gonna talk about that part. I'm going to talk about the motivated versus uh, accuracy versus um, uh, not. So the good lawyer account is pretty simple. So lawyers have a conclusion, uh, and they need to kind of form the evidence around that conclusion, right? And so under the good lawyer account, what that basically means is that people reason like lawyers. We try to uh, form the evidence around a conclusion, and errors emerge because we're too good at it, right? We're basically deluding ourselves. We're convincing ourselves uh, that the things that we want to be true are true, using our reasoning, okay? Uh, but the other account is that we kind of reason like philosophers, right? That we, we care about the truth, but we're not very good at figuring it out, right? We make mistakes along the way. We, along the way. we don't think that much about, we don't think uh, about the right sort of things. We, we kind of take uh, shortcuts and heuristics, and so we're, we're bad philosophers. I am aware, by the way, that Lionel Hutz is not a good lawyer, uh, but he's, or it depends on who you ask, I guess. So that's the two perspectives. I'm gonna give uh, uh, another example of this using quotations, which is something I like to do. So William James said, uh, or is attributed to have said, a great many people think they are thinking when they are merely rearranging their prejudices, okay? Great quotation, right? Uh, perfect example of this motivated reasoning idea. But then Pascal said, thought constitutes the greatness of people, right? And so if you take these two quotations seriously, they mean really different things. What James is talking about is that good lawyer idea that we use our thinking to justify our beliefs and behaviors, right? Uh, to convince ourselves, as I said, to, uh, to believe the things that we want to believe, essentially. Whereas what uh, Pascal is talking about is we use our, using our reasoning to inform our beliefs and behaviors. And as Ellen had pointed out, these things are not mutually exclusive, right? That is, we might sometimes do one thing and we might sometimes do the other thing. There are, in fact, both lawyers and philosophers in the world, um, and sometimes maybe both, right? The, what ha what's happened in the field, though, uh, which is of interest to me and what really got me into this topic, is that this, this motivated reasoning approach has kind of won the day uh, in a certain extent, okay? And so there are some very high-profile models of this. So this is uh, Jonathan Haidt's famous paper, uh, The Emotional Dog and the Rational Tail. The tail does not wake the dog. And so the model is pretty simple. We have intuitions that lead directly to judgment, and then reasoning comes after. Okay, so the function of reasoning there is to justify our intuitive judgments and, you know, the reason that we reason, therefore, is to convince other people that we're right, much like a lawyer would, okay? It's a social intuitionist model, is what he calls it. Uh, Hugo Mercer and Dan Sperber have argued that the function of reasoning is argumentation, right? It's, it, uh, again, we reason like lawyers. So the, one, the, my favorite example of this uh, sort of thing comes from Dan Cahan, who I guess is coming up... Uh, uh, frequently here. So I haven't explained what the CRT is yet, uh, although most probably know what it is. Just think about it as reasoning proficiency for now. And so the finding is this. Among Democrats, people who are essentially smarter, the Democrats that are essentially smarter, are more likely to think that climate change is a problem than Democrats who are not as smart. But for Republicans, it's the opposite, right? Republicans who are better at reasoning are less likely to believe that climate change is a problem than those who are worse at it. When, and what this implies, of course, is that they're using their reasoning to simply justify what they want to believe, right? It's not getting them closer to the truth, it's just polarizing them. Reasoning is backfiring in this context. Being good at it is, is uh, making you come to the wrong conclusions, okay? 
So that's, that's, that's in line with this idea. But there's lots of stuff, lots of areas in our lives where reasoning informs. Okay? Uh, and so I'm just going to give some examples from my own work, uh, and then I'll talk about fake news. Okay? So um, here's, the, here's the basic logic. If it's the case that our reasoning informs our beliefs and behaviors, then you'd expect people to reason more and who reason better to have different beliefs than those who do not. Right, who are more intuitive, right, who don't think that much. Uh, and so we see a, across a lot of different domains, people who are more reflective, who, who reason more and are better at it, have different types of beliefs in the context of you know, evidence. Right? People who, have, who think more have, tend to have more reasonable beliefs, essentially. Um, you even find uh, evidence for belief change, which, again, under this motivated reasoning idea, it just cannot happen. Right? If people only or primarily reason to inform their beliefs and behaviors, then they're not going to change what their beliefs are. They can only you know, get stronger. They're not going to deconvert from religion, for example. Right? Uh, but we find that people who are more reflective, not only do they you know, not believe in, uh, in supernatural religious beliefs, but they tend to have changed their belief over time, uh, which is something that presumes that they're actually using their reasoning to inform their beliefs based on some sort of evidence or whatever. Um, the, the, paper, the Jonathan Haidt paper that I mentioned at the start, that was about moral judgments. And even in that context, you see reasoning tends to uh, lead to different types of judgments and values. Okay? So the one that is probably the most directly related to uh, fake news is the stuff we did on what we refer to as pseudo-profound uh, bullshit. Sorry for cussing. Um, and so this is based on this, uh, this uh, great little essay from Harry, uh, Harry Frankfurt, um, which distinguishes between bullshit and lying. That is, lying is something that d implies that you care about whether it's true. Uh, whereas bullshitting is defined as more as if you don't care about whether it's true, you just want to get someone to buy your product or vote for you or whatever, right? Um, and so the way that we assessed whether people fall for bullshit was by using sentences like this. Transcendence preserves a doorway to excellence. <laughs> so, so great sounding sentence. Uh, I know that it's bullshit uh, by, kind of by definition, based on Frankfurt's definition at least, because it's a random sentence. We just took buzzwords and we selected them randomly and put them together in a sentence. And in fact, what you can do, so you get to the middle, the second term here is preserves. Whatever the meaning of this sentence is, you can change it to, by changing transforms. People rate those as equally pr profound, right? Because they're not judging it based on any meaning. They're just assuming that it's meaningful because they haven't thought about it that much. The key point here is that, again, people who are better at reasoning are just less, less likely to fall for bullshit, essentially, right? And so we have two really different patterns of results here, right? We have, in the context of uh, uh, climate change, this interaction, a polarization, as a function of how good you are at reasoning. But in the context of bullshit, reasoning helps you detect bullshit. But of course, this is not a motivated context. Not in, not, uh, for some it might, but not generally speaking it isn't. Okay? And so what's awesome and interesting about this fake news thing, which is kind of a terrible thing to say, but it's interesting for psychologists, is that it's both of these things, right? This is a politically charged context where motivations ought to have some sort of impact, uh, but it's also an example of bullshit. People are just making things up and publishing them on, uh, on, online. And when I say fake news, that's what I mean. I mean completely fabricated uh, news headlines. Okay, and so that's the person pictured there is Dave Rand. Uh, uh, this is the work that I started doing with him as a postdoc, and we're continuing on this. So everything I talk about, actually, for the rest of this talk, is work that with Dave. So the other thing that's interesting about the fake news context is that the dominant narrative in this context is firmly in the camp of the motivated reasoning good lawyer idea. Okay, most of the... Uh, the popular press pieces have been, apart from those that we've written ourselves, have been about partisanship. Uh, Dan Cahan, who has been mentioned again, uh, who's a big proponent of this sort of idea, he calls it identity protective cognition, same basic idea. He said that individuals are motivated consumers of misinformation, right? Uh, and so we disagreed. I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that's in these papers that you can find uh, subsequently. Okay, so let's be real clear about the hypotheses here. So I'm going to call this just motivated reasoning. And uh, I'll, I'll clarify what I mean by that in a second. But the basic idea is that people have, uh, in the context of fake news, motivations to believe the things that are consistent with their ideology. Right? You see a headline that says the Pope endorsed Donald Trump. You're a Republican. Maybe you have Catholic inclinations. That's a good, that's a good thing for you. You want that to be true. And you use your reasoning to facilitate your you know, belief in that thing. You convince yourself that it's true, essentially. And when I say motivated reasoning, I mean reasoning. Okay? Explicit deliberation about the content. Uh, and so what uh, Dan Cahan calls it is motivated system two reasoning, system two meaning analytic thinking, okay? 
So the term is used a lot um, to refer to group differences. I'm talking specifically about explicit reasoning to justify the things that we want to believe, okay? The, the other account, I'm just gonna call classical reasoning because it's you know, what Aristotle probably would have thought if you asked him, okay? That is, reasoning helps determine what's true and false in the world to some extent. Uh, and what this means is that people who are, uh, that analytic thinking helps basically people distinguish between true and false news content, okay? Uh, fake and real news, uh, using the terms, okay? And so they make very different predictions. So I'm gonna, this work is all modeled off that initial global warming correlation study, essentially. We wanna see if we find the same effect in the context of fake news that you see in the context of global warming, okay? And so we're, we're making predictions based on how good are people at reasoning and will that predict what they believe in the context of true and false news content, okay? So the motivated reasoning account says, people who are better at reasoning will be more likely to believe stories that are consistent with their ideologies and less likely to believe stories that are inconsistent with their ideologies. In both cases for the same reason, because they use their reasoning to convince themselves that the things that they want to be true are true. They want these to be true, and so there'll be a positive correlation. They don't want those to be true, negative correlation, okay? And the predictions are the same, regardless of whether the headlines are true or false, right? It's about whether they're politically consistent or inconsistent. It's not about whether they're true or false, okay? Whereas the classical reasoning account says, it'll be negative for the fake stories. In fact, people who are better at reasoning will be better able to discern between what's true and false. It's not just being skeptical about everything. It's about being accurate, about identifying uh, features of, of the content that trigger, you know, that uh, indicate that they might be wrong uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but this account doesn't distinguish uh, whether they're politically consistent or inconsistent, right? It's about whether they're true or false. And so you can see the contrast here, right? Uh, well, the motivated reasoning account focuses on whether it's consistent with their ideology or not. Uh, the classical reasoning account focuses on whether it's true or false, okay? So we, we have way more than four studies on this, dozens now, and we always get the same effects. Uh, so I just, I'm showing you four of the original ones, okay? And every one of the, these studies, and then the upset, all the other things that I'm gonna refer to in the context of fake news, they all have the same sort of design. We take actual content, you know, from, in this case, the American political context, uh, and present those, to, those things to people. So they're not fake, fake stories, they're actual fake, uh, news stories that were fact-checked to be s fake uh, based on Snopes and factcheck.org and so on, okay? Um, and the way that we deal with the messiness of reality is we, we have these large pretests and then we select headlines that are matched so that the pro-democratic headlines are on average as pro-democratic as the pro-republican headlines are pro-republican, okay? So they're, they're matched to be equally partisan, uh, okay? So here's some examples. Russian mansions Obama sees were meant to be illegal gifts to Sasha and Malia. Obviously, that's a pro-Republican headline. Um, I don't know why they'd want to live in Russia, but uh, whatever. Um, the middle one is a politically neutral one. The crone owner is giving people a bunch of money. And then obviously, uh, Trump being removed from office, that's pro-democratic. So, yes? In some cases, yes, not all cases. So, so, they, uh, so uh, among fake, they're always matched. Sometimes we match across both fake and real. Um, it doesn't matter really much for their conclusions, but yeah. Um, uh, and then we just, like we've asked a bunch of, uh, how to judge people, the, for them to judge the accuracy of the headlines in lots of different ways. Uh, uh, and it never matters for the results. So these are just two examples. Uh, this is, a, we ask about accuracy and bias, which is a no-no in one question. We ask about accuracy and bias separately doesn't matter at all, so, you know, whatever. Um, one thing you'll note about the headlines here is that they're kind of stupid, right? Like, the, the claims are, are uh, very surprising, and that's a feature of the phenomenon. I have not selectively put surprising things on here. Um, if you are making things up and you're trying to get ad revenue out of Facebook, the first thing you need to do is get people's attention, okay? And so the way to do that is you say something surprising. You don't make up a headline saying, you know, Donald Trump ate eggs for breakfast or something. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't fly, right? So you have to make some stuff up that's interesting. Um, when I say discernment, I mean, maybe, it, maybe Trump eating eggs in the morning would be surprising, I don't know. Um, uh, so when I say discernment, I mean overall accuracy, right? Best case scenario, people say that all the true stuff is true and all the false stuff is false and they would have a discernment score of one. 
Uh, but you know, people vary all along the lines there. Um, and politically congruent and congruent is what you'd kind of expect it to be. Uh, that is, if I'm looking, if the way we kind of recode the data so that a pro-democratic headline is, uh, is marked as politically congruent if the person's a Democrat, but incongruent if they're Republican, and then vice versa, right? Um, just to make things easier for presentation purposes. Uh, and we're using the, the CRT uh, to measure, broadly speaking, ad lib thinking, okay? So here's the, the famous bat and ball problem on the CRT. Uh, bat and ball cost $1.10 total, the bat cost $1 more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? I've said that sentence, those sentences like a, a million times in my life now. Um, so people say 10 cents. Obviously it's not 10 cents. If the ball costed 10 cents, the bat would have to cost $1.10 and in total it would be $1.20. The catch is 5 cents. What's fun about this problem is that there's this intuitive answer that's wrong. And so it involves lots of things. You have to be kind of smart enough to recognize it, that, you know, uh, to be able to do the math. You have to be uh, uh, interested enough to kind of uh, be motivated to solve it. But you have to also, in many cases, uh, check your answer. You have to, you know, 10 cents is going to pop into your head for most people. And you have to kind of stop and think about it, which is interesting. Um, it just so happens, by the way, since Alan gave a talk, in many cases, the, this task uh, predicts a lot of things over and above just numeracy. So uh, it doesn't seem to be only numeracy, although obviously numeracy is relevant. It's a math problem. Um, we also have, so in this case, we have seven different items. Uh, these are just reworded versions of the original three. Uh, and then there's four from a different uh, test that was developed recently. This, I'm mostly giving this part of the talk for Ellen, uh, um, and this is who developed these last four items. So these ones you can tell are not as numeracy based. If you're running a race and pass the person in second place, what place are you in? Uh, you're in second place, not in first place, right? Because you pass the person in second place. Um, um, so here are the correlations for all these items with numeracy. So you can see some are more highly correlated than others. Um, yeah, okay. So that was just a bit of a side note. It, for the purposes of, our, of, of, the, of these predictions, you don't have to think about it as a measure. You can think about it as a measure of intelligence, codification. The predictions are exactly the same. So it doesn't really matter how you interpret that measure uh, for, these, for these studies. Um, so I'm going to go through a bunch of correlations. Uh, and we're going to go one step at a time so that no one gets lost. Okay? Um, both accounts make the same prediction for fake headlines that are politically inconsistent. Uh, and I'm not going to bother explaining why. They're, it's negative, so they both get check marks. Great. What's more interesting is where they make different predictions. So fake stories that are uh, politically congruent, the motivated reasoning account says it should be a positive correlation with your capacity to solve those problems that I just showed you. And the reason is that if you're better at reasoning, you're better at convincing yourself that those headlines are true, right? Whereas the classical reasoning account says, well, you're going to recognize that they're false because reasoning helps facilitate you know, accurate belief formation or whatever. Uh, and here you see the correlation is in fact negative. Uh, in fact, negative in, to the same extent as for politically congruent. So there's not even an interaction here in terms of the size of the correlation, right? Um, so that's uh, a, a knock against the motivated reasoning account. And then again, the classical reasoning account says, really what we're expecting is that people who are better at reasoning are gonna be better able to discern between true and false content overall, okay? And that's what you see in every single case. In fact, we've done, like I said, the study dozens of times. Uh, we've, we always get this, we've done it in Ukraine, uh, Italy, France, Canada, and we've gotten the same results, okay? So remarkably consistent finding. Um, people who are better at reasoning are better able to discern between what's true and false in terms of news content, okay? Um, not particularly surprising if you weren't reasoning, reading the like, news coverage of the, of the stuff leading up to doing the study, okay? Um, so there you go. Now, let's forget about the CRT for a second, look at the means. There's some interesting things we can we can delineate here, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm blasting with four figures all at once, but they're basically identical. I, f I forgot to mention that across these studies, we're using different headlines, and they're being run at different times, right? The first study was run uh, near the inauguration, and then, you know, in, in the years intervening. Um, these ones were actually the same headlines, but two different sources. You can see how remarkably consistent the results are across all the studies, okay? So here's, here are a few things. First thing is that in two out of four cases, the two cases where we used a continuous uh, measure of accuracy, you see an interaction here. And the interaction is really counterintuitive. People are better at discerning between true and false content if it's consistent with their ideology, right? In the case where they might have the most sort of bias, they're, they're doing the best, presumably because that's the context where they have the most political knowledge. 
We have other studies where we measure political knowledge directly, and that also strongly correlates with whether people are able to discern between what's true and false, independently of how reflective they are. Uh, okay. Another thing, if you look at, so people are, you can just look at this figure, for example, more likely to believe things that are consistent with their ideology than things that are inconsistent. Okay, so that's, you know, what would typically be considered a motivated reasoning effect, not in my context, because I'm talking about reasoning as capital R reasoning. Um, but if you look at the effect size for what's true and false, it's way, 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 way bigger, right? Uh, the difference between true and false is much bigger than the difference between politically consistent and inconsistent. And what that means is if you're, if you're focusing on ideology in this context and not the actual truth of the headlines, you're missing most of the action in terms of what people's judgments are, right? right. And if you think about the way that this stuff has been covered uh, in the media, this is not at all consistent with that, right? Um, if, if, you want to, if you want one piece of information to predict whether people would be able to, you know, recognize whether something's true or false, or at least say that it is, knowing whether it's true or false is your best piece of information, not whether it's consistent with their ideology or inconsistent, which I think is kind of counterintuitive the way, based on the way we talk about these things. Um, the other thing is that this is the scale midpoint uh, in all these studies, okay? And so this is just a, mostly an aside. People are more accurate at rejecting fake news than they are at accepting true content, right? right. Um, again, kind of counter the way people talked about this. The, the bigger problem here is that people are overly skeptical about what's true when they should be saying these things are true. Uh, and it actually makes a lot of sense if you look at how, how kind of dumb the fake news headlines are. It's an easier judgment to make uh, to say that those things are false, particularly if you're like a reflective person, right? Um, all right. So now what I'm going to do is go through uh, probably too rapidly a bunch of additional findings that reinforce the same point. The reason I'm going to do it too rapidly is because, like I said, they reinforce the same point, but I just kind of want to give you a sense of the weight of evidence here, okay? So um, we, you can look at a bunch of different demographic controls, uh, education, income, none of these things really predict uh, over and above CRT. Uh, in some cases, they might be some prediction, but generally speaking, CRT is independent of them. Um, it doesn't matter if people have seen the headlines before or not. You can even remove the sources of the headlines entirely, that is it. It says New York Times, you can take that out. It does not impact people's judgments whatsoever. And there's a good reason for that, a uh, paper that we're, we're, uh, should be published pretty soon. Um, people, when they're judging the, the whether these headlines are true or false, they're doing it based on how plausible they sound. And so um, that gives them, uh, or at least they think that it gives them more information than just the source itself. So if you remove the source, it does not impact people's judgments, okay? Which is, which is bad because it actually is a really valuable source of information. But people just don't use that, probably because they're overconfident. Um, we have similar results in terms of sharing, although in the context of people's hypothetical sharing on social media, people who are more reflective just share less content overall because they don't want to be politically divisive, perhaps, or whatever. But the difference is larger still. That is, they share proportionally less fake content uh, if you take into account how much real content they're sharing. So a similar basic uh, finding. Um, you can look at Partisan news, not just false content, but misleading content from places like Breitbart, Infowars, whatever. Same basic results there. Um, and we, we looked at actual sharing of content on, on social media, uh, in this case, Twitter. And so we had people do the CRT, they gave us their Twitter handles, and then we would look to see what they share on social media. Okay. Now, um, what, what's being shown here is this is their CRT score. On the other axis is, is their um, fact checker trust score. So let me explain what that is. So in a previous study that Dave and I had done, we had uh, fact checkers rate the trustworthiness of a variety of different sources, 60 in total, okay? Um, and so what this shows is that people who are more reflective, who score higher on the CRT, the bat and ball problem and other ones like that, share more content from sources that fact checkers view as being trustworthy, probably because they are trustworthy, right? So this was run in the UK, so there's lots of sharing from BBC, from people that are higher in CRT, and less sharing from Daily Chaos, which is a, a, um, a, a hyperpartisan site, Fox News, Daily News, uh, et cetera. Okay? So actual sharing on social media is related to whether you're more or less reflective. People that are more reflective share higher quality news content, essentially. Okay? They also have different, uh, they follow different accounts. Uh, so these are intuitive people. These are reflective people. I think you can kind of see the general pattern of what's going on there. Um, <laughs> no offense to Justin Bieber, I guess. Uh, and Shakira, but, um, and uh, we, 
coming back to the sources, people who are more reflective are also better at able to discern between good and bad sources, again, based on the fact checker rating. So they, they have a better sense of what, what is a good source, even though in, based on their judgments, they don't really use them that much. Okay? Uh, we haven't just looked at the CRT, a bunch of different measures, including numeracy, also correlate with people's uh, ability to discern between true and false content, a bunch of things that relate to the kind of quality of thinking that they have. Um, the only one that I'll point out in uh, some specificity is this one about emotionality. So people who uh, score on a, on, a, on a trait level of emotionality, uh, the PNAS, um, are, less, are worse at discerning between true and false content, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because the, the stuff that, the thing that people are using to get people to share false content largely is the affectivity that Ellen was talking about. Just the emotional, strong emotional reactions, if you are more emotive, then that's going to have a bigger impact on you. In fact, we've done some experiments where we get people to kind of be more emotional using a kind of stupid manipulation where you just kind of ask them to be more emotional. But that by itself, even though it's a stupid manipulation, is sufficient to kind of increase belief in, in fake news but not true content, right? Um, we also have a new paper that I uh, was accepted uh, when I got in, uh, into Amsterdam and I finally got to check my email, so that was good, uh, despite being tired. Um, and so you can actually selectively decrease belief in fake news, uh, or that is increase in belief in fake news and decrease belief in true content by forcing people to give intuitive answers, right? So if you, if you, you know, make them give the first thing that pops into their head and then you give them a working memory load, then what, ha what happens is they believe more false content uh, and they disbelieve more true content, right? So they get inaccurate in both cases, uh, more inaccurate in both cases. And then if you give them a chance to reason subsequently, then they improve in both directions. They will be more likely to reject false content and accept true content, okay? Um, a couple more things. Uh, this, this thing that Facebook was doing to start uh, when they were first trying to deal with this fake news problem was they're putting fact checker warning labels on the bottom of headlines. They would say, this has been disputed by third party fact checkers. Um, what we showed in this case was that, and I'll explain why this is related in a second, that that does have an effect. If you put the warning on fake news headlines, people will believe it less. But they also believe fake headlines that do not have a warning more, right? That is, they take the absence of a warning to uh, imply that it's been verified. And so it, it backfires. The reason I bring this up here is because there's no interaction whatsoever with political consistency, right? Uh, which is actually quite interesting, right? Uh, similarly, uh, a single prior exposure to a fake news headline increases later belief in that uh, headline, even if you put a warning on it at exposure. And again, in this case, still no interaction. Uh, you, you still get the effect if it's politically inconsistent or politically consistent. So think about what that means. The headline is something that is anti-Clinton, for example. The person is a Democrat. They still believe it more if it's been repeated, right? Because it's a low-level cognitive effect. It's increasing the fluency. It seems more familiar to them the second time they see it, uh, and then they believe it more. And so the, the motivate, motivated aspect of this is not counteracting that uh, at all, in fact. People are still, they're, they're basically believing these things because they're not thinking that much about what they see, right? Uh, it's, it's not about motivation as much as it is about, uh, you know, not thinking about the things that you see. Okay, all right, there's my animation. Uh, okay, so interim summary. When am I supposed to finish? What is my... Okay, great. Uh, okay, I, 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 I was I was going to like warn at the start. I put uh, I chunked a bunch of extra slides at the end of this. Mo twelve. Okay, twelve. All right, and mostly most of it was like at four o'clock in the morning. So uh, I don't know how long the next the part was going to take, and so that's, I might I was probably going too fast. But uh, I want to get everything in. So you know whatever. It's not that I didn't plan. It's just that well, that's because I didn't plan. So whatever. Um, uh, so we basically. To summarize the fake news part, no evidence whatsoever for polarization as a function of analytic thinking, right? We don't get the same effect as you see in global warming as in the context of fake news, okay? Um, although people do believe headlines that are consistent with their ideology more than ones that are inconsistent, it's just that this is not being facilitated by their capacity to reason, right? And it makes a lot of sense, and I'm going to talk about this uh, in the third part of the talk. Um, people are exposed to different things 
in their political worlds, and that means different things are plausible to them, okay? So it's not so surprising that people are believing things that are consistent with their ideology. Uh, um, we have pretty consistent evidence that what's really driving belief in fake news is just people aren't thinking enough about what they see on social media. All right, people who are better at reasoning, who spend more time uh, thinking, generally speaking, are better able to discern between what's true and false. Okay, um, and so what's interesting about this is that th there's there's a there's a great message here, which is that if it's the case that you know the people are uh, spreading and believing uh, false content on social media because they're just not thinking enough about uh, that stuff, then maybe we can get them to think more about it, right? Uh, maybe in subtle sort of ways. So that's what this paper that we just put up uh, this week. Uh, it's not published, we just put it online, um, uh, it attempts to do. So I'll explain what that is. So in this study, what we do is we, uh, in a first set of experiments, we, we give people at the start of the experiment a single politically neutral headline, okay? And what we do is we just say, we're, in, we're doing a pretest. we want to know if you think this is accurate or not, okay? The whole purpose of this is just to, to kind of get them to think about accuracy a little bit, okay? To, to prime the accuracy motive, as it were, right? Uh, and then what we do is we subsequently, for the second part of the experiment, give them a bunch of politically charged headlines, right? And we ask them, would you consider sharing this on social media, right? And so we want to see if asking about accuracy decreases selectively believe, uh, the sharing of false content, which was what you, I guess, what you'd presume if the fact that people are sharing this is because they're not reflecting that much specifically about whether they're accurate. People are sharing them without even considering that they might be false, essentially, okay? Uh, and so that's what we see uh, across uh, a few different studies. And we have more of these also in Italy, France, and Canada that uh, replicate these results. Um, if you um, remind people about accuracy relative to no reminder at all, or compared to uh, an active control, in that case, it was just, is this entertaining? You, you see selectively less sharing of false content, okay? Don't worry about this importance treatment. I'm not gonna explain it. Um, and so you don't get the same effect for true content, right? Uh, it's only selectively decreasing sharing of false content. So again, that's, this implies that people are sharing this stuff because they're just not thinking that much specifically about whether it's accurate, which seems crazy, but you know, here it is. Uh, again, uh, no interaction here with political consistency, right? People are sharing less stuff that's consistent with their ideology, inconsistent with their ideology, whatever, okay? So again, political ideology and the concordance with that uh, with the kind of slant of the headline is not really explaining what's going on here that much, okay? So we wanted to test this, that's hypothetical sharing in the lab, so not too interesting. So we did, well, whatever, I think it's interesting, but whatever. Um, what we did is we tried to take this out into the field. The field in this case is Twitter, uh, which is a weird field. Uh, we all agree, and this is a weird experiment for that reason. So we created bots, uh, and we had to do this very, it was quite a difficult process. Um, because Twitter doesn't want you to do that, and so we had to like, you know, do it surreptitiously. Um, and when you create bots, you, we, what we did is we uh, followed a bunch of people who share content from low quality sources, Breitbart, Infowars, et cetera. Um, and then some people who you follow, follow you back. And once they follow us back, that means we can send them direct messages, okay? And so what we did is we had about 5,000 people follow a bunch of different bots, uh, and then we sent them a, a, a message, just a single direct message, and, we, and the message, uh, the only thing that we cared about this, there's a bit of a backstory about why we would ask such a weird thing from a cooking bot, but we don't really care about what, how they interpret this. We just want them to open it and see the word accurate, essentially, uh, to trigger them to think about accuracy uh, and see what happens subsequently. Now, what I'm going to show you is a very conservative analysis because we don't even know if people opened the message, okay? Uh, it's hard for how to determine that, and there's reasons that they, you could open it when, without knowing, uh, without us being able to tell. So this is just everybody who got sent a message is considered treated, and which is definitely not the case, okay? So we're underestimating our effect. Uh, and this is what you see. Um, people, this is similar to what I said, showed before in terms of news quality content. If you got sent the message in the 24 hours that follow, you share more high quality content, for example, New York Times, and less low quality content, Breitbart, uh, Daily Caller, et cetera. The Breitbart is significant here because those were people, these are people that were selected specifically because they share content from Breitbart. And so that alone would be a key kind of test. They're sharing less of that content after the, after the intervention, which again, is a single direct message to their inbox, okay? Do you, do you want to ask a question now or? No, no, I'm gonna ask a question. These texts are being sent to the one DM. One DM, that's right. That's right. 
Yeah. So, yeah. Right? Crazy. I know. Right? I know. Totally great. Uh, so, um, uh, it was a great study. I, I'm still thinking about how great the study was, but I can't, I can't remember what I was talking about. Anyways, so, um, so, so there's, a, there's a big contrast here, right? So we have this initial study about global warming where we have this interaction effect, and then in the context of fake news, even sharing, which, you know, it's even and we know that it's not that much about accuracy because what I just told you, people still don't show that effect in the context of sharing, okay? Um, and so what is going on with that, right? Um, maybe it's that global warming is unique, right? This is a page... You can't read this. I don't know what, what the hell it means. It's from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Climate, global warming is a very complicated issue. You know, people who have opinions about it who aren't scientists don't really know what the basic science is, right? Because they're not scientists. Uh, but uh, fake news is not that, right? You don't need to be an expert on, you know, uh, um, current affairs to know that this doesn't make that much sense. Okay? So maybe that's... Maybe, but we still don't know which of these is the unique case. Right? Fake news is just a case study. Maybe this is one case where um, motivated reason doesn't, doesn't pan out, but it's more typical like this. And I want to remind you that the, the, the whole point here is to figure out what is the most common source of errors. Right? Uh, and so now we, say, we know that in the context of fake news, motivated reasoning is not a good explanation for what's going on, but we want to say now maybe this is unique. And so w one other thing I want to point out about this uh, that I've argued with Dan a little bit about is the, the, the uh, way that you evidence this effect. So what's often done is that you evidence this effect with an interaction, uh, but that's not the right way to do it. Because if you only had Republicans in a study, then what you'd expect is a negative correlation. If you only have Democrats, you expect a positive correlation. So the fact that you get interaction is just because we happen to have samples that have both Democrats and Republicans in them. What you actually should be predicting is a positive effect uh, for congenial things, and a negative effect for non-congenial things, which uh, in this case comes out as both a safe effect in opposite directions, essentially. Okay, so let's be clear about this. To evidence motivated reasoning, that is CRT, increasing polarization, you need uh, significant effects in opposite directions. Okay, a null in one case does not tell you that motivated reasoning is happening. It tells you that there's something else Maybe it doesn't predict for this group because they don't care about the issue. You know, there's lots of different reasons, a million different ways you can explain a null, okay? So what I'm going to do is go through, uh, this is all new stuff, um, a bunch of different issues. Just, and I'm not going to explain what the issues are or even what the items are because I'm just going to blast you with a bunch of different things to show you how infrequently you get the mode reasoning effect, okay? Um, and so here we have... Uh, uh, 17 different scientific issues. We selected specifically issues that would be politically polarizing, okay? So th they're not representative of all science beliefs. It's not stuff like we're not asking about, you know, about atoms. We're asking about polarizing, polarized scientific issues, okay? All of which could each, each be considered a test of a potential motivated reasoning effect, okay? Um, and so here I'm going to show correlations uh, with CRT as a function of whether people are Democrats or Republicans, um, and it's not just CRT, it's actually science, uh, basic science knowledge, a bunch of different things go into this measure, okay? So you can't read these numbers, but it doesn't matter uh, because I'm going to put some colors on the screen so that you can interpret them. Um, so everything in purple is an example of just a straight directional effect, right? People who are more sophisticated believe the more pro-scientific thing, right? And so th there are some cases where there's no effects, you know, here, 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 but in many cases there are significant effects, in some cases for both Democrats and Republicans in the same direction, right? So definitely not motivated reasoning in those cases. In some cases, just a lack of predictability for one group versus the other group. Here are the three cases where you get uh, the significant effect in opposite directions, the Pac-Man effect, right? Um, one is global warming, which replicates what Dan had done, although we didn't get that in the first study. And the other one is evolution belief, and Big Bang belief, which we don't, again, get consistently in the first study. Okay? So that's, it. That, that's the thing. Very, very little evidence of the Pac-Man effect, except for uh, three issues in one sample. Okay? Uh, but more evidence for a consistent positive effect. Uh, now I'm going to do it. What well, you might be thinking, maybe those science issues weren't that polarizing, so I'm going to do it again. In this case, science issues and also political opinions. 
Uh, why we would predict that to be uh, in opposite directions, I'm not going to go into. I'm just trying to blast you with lots of different things so that you'll believe me when I tell you uh, things. Okay? So here we're going to look at both science beliefs and political opinions. Okay? And the formatting of the, of the thing is, because I just took these as screenshots off the papers, because I did this last night at 4 o'clock, uh, so whatever. Um, so here, again, in all purple are the ones that are just directionally related. What this shows is that people that are more reflective are less likely, that is, Democrats who are more reflective, are less likely to hold the more conservative opinion. Every single one of these is coded that positive is more conservative, right? And negative is less conservative. Um, uh, hardly any effects for Republicans at all uh, in terms of that. So we find that, generally speaking, that Democrats tend to score higher, higher on the CRT, but among Republicans, CRT does not predict their opinions, apart for this one question about freedom of speech. Okay? But again, no evidence, there's no, not a single case, actually across both of these cases, again, these are just a bunch of science issues, not a single case where you get the opposing effects in opposite directions. The only marginal case, again, is maybe global warming, although it's not significant, in, but we, we get the same general pattern. Okay? So what this is indicating to us is that global warming is the unique case where we get the, the Pac-Man effect. In most cases, if there's an interaction at all, uh, it's because there's no effect for one group and there's a larger effect for the other group, for, which could happen for any number of different reasons. And I can't explain what all those possible reasons would be for all these issues, obviously. That would be impossible to do, and I'm already running out of time. Okay? So let's just look at this. So the, that open jaw where you get significant effects in opposite directions occurs in three cases out of 42 possible cases, right? And, and uh, none of them are consistent across studies. Even global warming is not consistent across the samples. Uh, we generally get the, the broad pattern, but it's still not that consistent, which means we're, we, we don't find that much evidence for, the, for this general effect, even though that, that global warming uh, finding that uh, was published in 2012 has had a huge influence on the way that we think about these things, it seems to be an outlier, okay? Um, generally speaking, people who are more reflective have a more pro-scientific attitude, um, but you know, it depends on what the issue is. There's probably a million different reasons why those things differ for, from issue to issue, uh, which I'm not gonna get into, okay? Generally speaking, CRT seems to be a, a stronger predictor for Democrats than Republicans, which is also something that's interesting, but I'm not gonna talk about right now, okay? So what you might, might be thinking is that, are you, like, Motivated reasoning seems to be the most pervasive thing. <laughs> if you just go on the internet, it seems like it's everywhere, right? Like here's an example. I don't know why that's so like light, but what this shows is, based on what you've heard or read, has the testimony and evidence presented during the impeachment inquiry, Trump's impeachment inquiry, inquiry uh, made you uh, more likely to support impeachment. Democrats are like, oh hell yeah, uh, or you know, less likely in Republicans, you know. Republicans do not think that that's good evidence. Now, something I, want, I mentioned before very briefly, I want to mention again, is that this does not mean that motivated reasoning is occurring. Right? This does not constitute evidence of motivated reasoning. When I say reasoning, again, I mean explicit reasoning uh, per se. Right? Here's some news coverage of uh, Sondland's, uh, um, uh, um, whatever, the stuff, she was sitting down and talking to people. Uh, um, so there's some coverage of that from the New York Times, CNN, whatever. And here's one from Fox News. It says, President Trump declares it's all over for impeachment inquiry after Sondland testimony. Right? So if you spend, if you're only watching Fox News, and you know, you might reasonably conclude that nothing's going on. Right? Based on the information that you present. Now what you might be saying is that maybe selective expo exposure is the, is the key. And that is a really important issue. Not something I'm talking about. I'm talking about what to, how do people reason with stuff that's in kind of in front of them. Um, but that still doesn't seem to me to be a motivated reasoning effect either. Uh, people probably don't spend that much time thinking about which sources they're going to use. They just go to the source that they typically use, right? It's still a kind of intuitive bias and not a reflective one, okay? And I'm, so I'm, I'm going to have a brief aside about belief bias, and then I'm going to explain some things that relate to the experiments that Ellen had talked about. So one... Oh, are we running out of time? Okay. Yeah, don't, don't worry, it won't take that long. So belief bias is one of the oldest effects in cognitive psychology, okay? All mammals can walk, whales are mammals, therefore whales can walk, right? This is a logically valid syllogism. If you ask people, judge the logical validity of the syllogism, ignore whether you believe the, the, the premises or conclusion, they'll still say that it's logically invalid because they do not believe that whales can walk, 
right? This is not informed by ideology, right? There's no whales not walking ideology. They just, you know, the believability of the conclusion uh, interferes with their, logical, the, their assessment of logicality. You can make syllogisms that have political content and you'll see the same thing, right? People who are liberals are going to be uh, cool with this one, but not cool with that one, and vice versa for conservatives. This does not mean that they're engaging in motivated reasoning. All it tells you is that they have different beliefs, which we knew already, okay? Now, uh, what about the experimental evidence? Why am I talking about belief bias? Well, in many of these cases, prior beliefs confounds the experiment, okay? Uh, and so I'm gonna just briefly go over what an example of one of the experiments is. Uh, so in this experiment that Dan did, uh, we have to evaluate the validity of this open-mindedness test. And then you tell people either that skeptics or people who believe did well or skeptics did well on the test. Okay, and then you ask them, is it a valid test? So what you obviously find is that Republicans think that it's less valid if you say that uh, believers are open-minded, uh, whereas uh, um, more valid if it's skeptics that are, and then vice versa for Democrats. And then the motivated reasoning effect is that this increases as a function of whether people are more reflective. Right? And so that's what the pattern looks like for uh, in this, this data. So this is the, this is the interaction for, CR, for CRT. Ignore the control condition. You can see the interaction is larger for people that are more reflective. Right? The, the crossover here is much larger than it is for here. So I'm going fast, but you can see what I mean. Okay? That's basically what Ellen was talking about. Now, in this case, um, we aren't assigning people's motivation. Right? It's actually a kind of a pseudo experiment in the sense that the, the, the critical factor of people's motivation is something that we're assuming based on their, their ideology. But people might have different beliefs about the plausibility of whether an individual who is a skeptic uh, is open-minded. And that's going to validly uh, determine how they assess that test, right? Uh, inferring the quality of evidence conditional prior beliefs does not entail political motivation, right? Here's an example. Precognition. Uh, we had evidence in this paper that precognition exists, people justifiably were very skeptical about this, right? Our prior beliefs is a way to inform how we assess evidence. That's how we form theories, right? And so we can't cut out the fact that people have prior beliefs. It could be perfectly reasonable to use those to inform how we judge information that we're given, right? Um, so maybe what you're thinking is that maybe if you take prior beliefs into account, you still see an effect of political motivation. The answer is no for that, okay? So here's a new paper also that we uh, recently put out. Um, this is what you expect. This is the open jaw pattern. We're basically just replicating a previous study that Dan Cahan did. And so that's what you see. It doesn't replicate exactly. Um, but the biggest effect here is uh, climate skeptics are open-minded is viewed as being quite unlikely if you're high CRT, okay? Among Democrats, obviously, all right? But what happens if you ask people about whether they think, like, so what we did is before this study was run, we asked people um, in a, in different types of things about whether they, who, who do they think is more open-minded, and one of those groups happened to be uh, climate skeptics versus deniers. So they didn't know what was part of the study, but we asked about it beforehand, and so that's what you see. So if you model this based on people's prior beliefs instead of their ideology, you see the exact same pattern of results, right? And if, what, in fact, if you control for ideology, uh, prior beliefs, the ideology effect disappears, but if you control for ideology, the prior belief effect does not disappear. This is, although these are pretty small differences, we did it again uh, with uh, four different types of measures. In this case, is an IQ test, CRT, political knowledge, and scientific reasoning. In every case, you can see prior belief was a stronger uh, predictor and over basically dropped out the effect of identity uh, once you take prior beliefs into account. Okay, so um, again, even in the experiments, very little evidence for motivated reasoning. Uh, um, it seems to be it's driven mostly by people's prior beliefs. It just so happens that people that are more reflective have different types of prior beliefs than people that are not. Democrats and Republicans also have different types of prior beliefs. Um, people that are more reflective, we have a different study about this, tend to be more deferential to their prior beliefs, uh, which based on the models that we did in that paper is actually a closer approximation to Bayesian updating. Okay, so it could be perfectly reasonable uh, for them to to judge based on their prior beliefs. In this context, Democrats who are more reflective are, remember, saying that climate skeptics are not open-minded. They are correct. Based on our own studies, climate skeptics are less open-minded than people who are believers. And so it's, it, to say that they're engaging in motivated reasoning and they're wrong, they're actually more correct by saying that, okay? Um, 
All right, so I'll offer some conclusions and we can have some questions. So, remarkably little evidence for motivated reasoning, okay? Uh, I'm being a little bit provocative, but I think that the evidence supports it. No evidence for polarization as a function of action analytic thinking in the context of fake news. Not across a bunch of different issues, uh, science issues or political issues. And the experimental uh, effects, I mean, at least this, I've talked about one of them, so there's probably other cases where motivated reasoning actually does happen. Uh, in many cases, it's confounded by prior beliefs. So I want to be clear about this. I'm not saying that motivated reasoning never happens, right? I'm just saying if we're going to talk about the most common form of errors, this is not what we should be talking about, okay? It might happen in some context, and we've got to figure out why and when that happens. But generally speaking, it's not explaining a lot of what's going on. Even in experiments that are explicitly designed to, to create it, uh, to, to uh, get it to come out. Um, generally speaking, people that are better at reasoning have make more sound judgments. Context of uh, news content, uh, science beliefs, um, and they're more differential to prior beliefs, which, uh, given these two things, probably is a reasonable thing for them to be, be doing. Okay? And so if we go back to these two explanations, this good lawyer, bad philosopher thing, um, this is a really compelling and interesting way to think about how people reason, but it doesn't explain a lot about how we do it. Okay? We, 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 people generally do try to get to the truth, but they just kind of make mistakes along the way. The bigger problem is that people just don't think that much about what they see on social media. And uh, it's kind of obvious because it's mostly just like babies and dogs and stuff. And so you see a news headline, you're not thinking about it. That's, that, it's a simple explanation, but I think it explains a lot of what's going on. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, they, that's it. Thank you for listening. I also started late, so I was like, you know, that's not my fault. If if I if I say yes to you, you can ask me about law, though. Well, let's while I figure this out with my <laughs> limited cognitive capacity, let's uh, ask the first question, Ella. Um, so uh, Who? So really interesting, first of all. Thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering. So I've been interested. It is on. Oh, it is. Look at <laughs> that. Thank you. Um, I'm really interested in, as I was mentioning in my talk, I'm very interested in understanding. Um, the kind of boundary conditions between when, we, when are we going to get more typical reasoning and when are we going to get more motivated reasoning. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you might be able to help me through um, thinking about that within the context of what you've been doing. Um, and, and in particular, I'm, I'm going to ask you to think about what might be some of the effects of your designs on producing more typical thinking so that maybe something else could have emerged. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, um, in your fake news uh, in your fake news studies, you ask them. I believe I, I, you didn't mention you didn't talk about the specifics around it, but I think you asked them the question: Is this accurate or not accurate? Yeah. So they're on guard. Yeah, they're, they're, they're explicitly asked to think about: mm -hmm. Is it accurate or not? Which I'm not usually asked on Facebook, yeah. by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I, I'm wondering if that's if that's one, and I think your later experiments suggest absolutely that's one of it. Put people on guard. Yeah. Uh, you you used an accuracy prime later on Twitter, which yeah. was fascinating, by the way. Um, so I think that just putting people on guard is one is one way of switching um, between the two. That's a boundary condition. Can um, I can I, can I address yeah that? please? So uh, yes, uh, definitely. If you ask about accuracy, that probably primes accuracy motives, which is why that experiment works. Uh, but we also don't get the more of a reasoning effect in the context of sharing decisions, right? If you just ask people, don't ask, what, don't ask about accuracy at all, but just ask about whether they would consider sharing them, you don't get the, you don't get the, you get the exact same negative correlation basically there. Like that was in one, uh, so, so uh, there's no accuracy motive there. Uh, but there, there could be. If I'm asked what, whether or not I would share something, yeah. suddenly I'm, I'm thinking about, oh, maybe I shouldn't. Yeah, maybe. I, I, yeah. I think there's, I, I think there's yeah. still something there, it, maybe. It, it at least approximates gen people's general, like, what the motives are. So, yeah, but, but maybe being in a study primes accuracy motives, too. Yeah, right? you know? possibly. So yeah, I, so yeah. that's another good, yeah. that, that's another maybe yeah. boundary kind of yeah. condition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just want to kind of hear your thoughts on these. Yeah. So, so another one would be, um, I'm curious, you, you use repeated measures experiments. And we know from other studies in decision making that having repeated measures can increase deliberation, mm -hmm. and it affects particularly the highly numerate. So I right. actually think that might that that part of your design might be another might be another boundary condition. But but I'm curious, have you ever you might have a within a between subject as well as a within subject experiment inside those de designs, depending upon how you design them. Have you ever looked at what people responded to first? 
Uh, that's a great question. No, we have not. It's they're all randomized the headlines, so we would we could look at the first headline for sure. I, I think that'd be really interesting because I think it might help us better understand these boundary mm -hmm. conditions. We do, by the way, have the Twitter experiment or the Twitter study that correlated people's actual tweets with uh, CRT. So that, but we, that was not. There's no one like we don't assess the motivated reasoning account for that. But yes, okay. Check first. Carry on. Yeah, um, I, I think that was all. Th that that's kind of what I wanted to chat about. Can, can you think of anything else? in your experiments that also maybe could point towards a boundary condition. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I was thinking about the boundary conditions of the, like, so the, so it, look, looking at the science beliefs thing, for example, given that we don't find the open jaw that frequently, there's no, there's no, that's just people's beliefs interacting with the thing. So that, that, that probably is not something that we're doing in terms of priming uh, action motivations. I, I was usually thinking about it because of that. What are these unique cases where you get the effect and like what's unique about global warming. It might be that it's just particularly, uh, it's, it's the right kind of combination of there's enough experts on both sides mm -hmm. that you can more easily kind of decide between them. And so that the, the ease at which one can self-delude, as it were, in that context is different than for other, other contexts. But I, that's yeah. pure speculation, I'm not sure. Yeah, interesting, thank you. Yeah. Uh, nothing about law. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm asking a, like a big picture kind of question. Even in your, um, ju uh, ver very interesting stuff. I'm re really uh, fascinating. Um, the, but aren't you also, in your big picture, um, also um, assuming even that there is some kind of motivated, I wouldn't say reasoning, but motivated choice of information sourcing. Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, it's almost certainly, and like, I would, uh, so, so people I'm, I'm just going to, because, like, the per it's, it's ironic that you quoted Pascal, who famously thought that uh, it's advantageous for us to believe yeah, in sure. God, and therefore we should hang around religious people. Yeah, it's got great quotes, though, so. Uh, <laughs> and that, that, that is a kind of uh, motivated reasoning about the accuracy of the source or the neglect of accuracy of, of the source of information that you're um, sourcing yeah. in your yeah. uh, so, so learning process. Well so that, 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 that the, the question is, <coughs> is d do you assume that, ki that kind of motivated, motivated um, sourcing in your model or, is it, or, or, d or do you think there's something else that could explain it? Uh, yes, I mean, people, I, we know that people have different motivations uh, and that has impacts. Uh, what I would say is that it's often motivated kind of unreasoning, right? That is, you're, you, um, you come up against something that is aversive to you because it's counter to what you believe, and then you stop thinking about it instead of, uh, you know, explaining it away. You just, it's easier to stop thinking than to think. And so if your account focuses on that, then you're going to probably explain more variance. Basically. If the term then was motivated processing, you would sign up for that. Yeah, then. I would be more. Uh, yeah, I would be more open to motivated processing. It's pretty vague, but that's I'm cool with that yeah. too. Mm -hmm. I wasn't quite uh, convinced by your claim that you need the open jaw structure in order to establish uh, motivated reasoning. Wouldn't it be the case that once one acknowledges or once one sees that there is a positive effect of 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 higher uh, reasoning capacities? Uh, in principle, or for those that group that 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 is in tune with with uh, with the claim, wouldn't it then be sufficient to see that there is no effect on the other side, <coughs> for for concluding that there has to be something that neutralizes this effect, and the presumption then would be that this is motivated reasoning. Uh, well, it would. It, it depends on how strict you want to talk about motivated reasoning. If if you get a null, where you're expecting a, a, an effect you can't still count that as evidence for the effect, right? That is, what that means is if, if you take both of those as evidence for motivated reasoning, then um, it's, it's basically doubling up the possible evidence for motivated reasoning, and therefore it's not a very strict test of the account. Um, and, and so, like, I think about this way. For, uh, the count predicts for Republicans that it should be a negative correlation with climate change. If you find a null there, you can't therefore say that that's evidence for the claim. If you only ran a study with Republicans, you wouldn't say it's evidence that you happen to have Democrats as a sample should not be therefore evidence that you found uh, positive evidence for your account. I think 
Steve's got something uh, interesting to say. And not on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, first of all, thank you for the for the talk and for the amazing research. Uh, I'm wondering whether you had measures of uh, certainty and also measures of the probability that some fake news story is, uh, is still true. Yeah. Because then the cognitive abilities might work in the direction of planting a seed of doubt. Because if you have, you're good in cognitive abilities, you also know that you don't have the means to verify. You use some intuitions that are, in your view, preferable yeah. to your party leanings, yeah. but still, so, so that's the, the, the that's yeah. uh, people with, uh, with high cognitive abilities, do they have uh, more tendency to have a seed of doubt? Yeah, uh, they, they t typically. Um, we're doing an experiment now, which is sort of related to what you're talking about. Uh, who's familiar with the illusion of explanatory depth? So you, you have a toilet. If you say, do you know how a toilet works? And people are like, oh, yeah. Like you flush her in the water or whatever. And <laughs> you say, OK, explain to me explicitly the mechanisms about how it works. They're like, well, I guess I don't know how it works. <laughs> you can actually decrease people's confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're doing is we're using that as a manipulation for decreasing the sharing of false content. Right? We, we confront them on their overconfidence on policy issues, and then we get them to see if they'll share uh, political content, which has nothing to do with the policy issues, and see if that decreases sharing. So we're what you're saying, but also experimental, basically. Okay, we have some guys sitting in the back here. Yes, first Steve, and then you're up front. Okay. Thanks, Gordon. Great talk. Um, yeah, I want to focus on the, the last thing towards the end where you <coughs> analyze the skeptic open-mindedness kind of thing. Okay. And I was wondering if you could sort of connect us back to that whole series of studies about the um, the skin cream, gun control, and then Washburn and Skitkas. I'm sure you know they they had a yeah. you know series of ten or fifteen different places where they always found what was taken to be motivated reasoning. And I'm not sure that you've addressed all of that. So this one is actually the gun control experiment. <coughs> so uh, the the prior belief here is about. Um, so, so let's think about Ellen. I wish I could have Ellen slide up here. So, when people are judging, so it was you said it's a math problem, right? Um, but it's not exactly a math problem because you have to assess the validity of the evidence that's presented in front of you. And so, it's still, you know, it could be that the researchers were wrong, or that 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 was a that is um, just one piece of evidence, but there's other evidence. And so, it does make sense still in that context. To I mean, in this case, I don't want to make a normative argument, anyways. It just happens to be the case that people's priors in the context of the gun control experiment explains their behavior, not their identity, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't appear to be identity protective cognition. And so one thing that Dan has talked about to us about this is that maybe identity through priors is the way that it works. And so, you know, uh, fair enough. But um, it's still priors that's doing all the work. So is that address? You know, uh, like, and, uh, and that's only, you know, two of, out of all the experiments. So there's probably other things that we have to talk about there. Yeah, okay, but then where is the motivated cognition in there? Where is the CRT performance? You've now removed that from... No, no, this is the interaction with CRT and their, and their judgment. And so, oh, okay. Yeah, and so once you take that... So once you take priors, that's explaining what the interaction is, but not their ide political identity, basically. Um, okay, so yeah. people with higher CRT are better able to apply their priors. Yeah, that's right. Is that's basically right. what you're saying. Exactly. And then the next step is that if the priors are actually correct, then they're better Bayesian reasoners. That's right. In that sense, yeah. okay, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, all right. I'm uh, Jakob Solberg. I'm uh, working at the political science department. So obviously, I'll ask a political science-related question. Great. All right. Um, one of the like major or impo more important variables is like how you judge retrospectively the economy of, of the of the the current economy of the nation yeah. or in the country. Mm -hmm. And it, normally you find, so that's the, on the y-axis. And on the x-axis you can put political, uh, mo often it's political knowledge, but I could also see a CRT on that one. And then you put um, any kind of uh, political predisposition, like party ID, and you will find that uh, you find a Pac-Man, basically, depending on what party is in government. If, uh, uh, if it matches your party ID, uh, goes up by knowledge, and goes down if you're the opposing party ID. Um, and then a couple of years go, and there's an election, and the current party in government is kicked out, and then uh, suddenly the old party, and you see like a reversed Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. 
immediately. So I, I just wanted to hear your, your thoughts about this. Is this sort of in line with, the, or how do you think, based on your results on this your entire research program, how would you think about, about this? Is this more like a global warming? That's one case of where you might have this, or is this something else going on? Great question. So um, it could be a case like global warming, although my explanation is uh, that, so what we find is that people who are political moderates are the least reflective. Okay, and so it uh, doesn't matter if people that are extreme are more reflective than people that are moderates. And so my expectation is that effect is not being driven by the people who are high CRT, it's being driven people by people that are low CRT. That is, people that are more reflective know more about what the economy, like, uh, uh, that is, everyone has to guess for the question, right? Because they don't have access to what, wha how the economy is doing, they have their own kind of personal whatever situation. Um, and so the, CR the high CRT guesses are more kind of uh, based in something. And the only thing that they can base them in is their kind of experience in the world, their ideology. Whereas people that are low on CRT, they're kind of somewhat ideological, but not really. And they also don't give a shit about how the economy is doing that much or whatever. And then they just kind of guess and it's not predictable. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So that's my, that's my explanation for that. I don't know if it's true or not. But okay. <laughs> Thanks. So um, uh, you touched on selective exposure and it was just making me think about this other thing that, that um, maybe cross-classified some of these cases, uh, the need for closure, and how many of these questions had, uh, or how that's either cross-classifying the people's CRT scores, or um, at least for the um, global warming cases, it just seems like it doesn't, you know, very, there's very little information you're gonna give me that's gonna make me reopen the question. Yeah. And I don't think that's because I'm particularly you know, high on need for closure, um, but uh, that, I, I imagine that for, that that's going to be the same for lots of these different people, at least on the cases that mm -hmm. seem like the motivated reasoning ones. So I was wondering if you had a control for that or any general thoughts on how need for closure is going to interact. So not in the science belief one, but we had we did use need for closure in some of the fake news studies. It didn't predict very well at all and doesn't correlate that highly with CRT. But those are like really weird questions because you wouldn't have them. Um, they, weren't, they weren't questions. They weren't related to it. It was just the scale or whatever. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so apart from that, I don't know. So, so maybe that's the thing that was you're picking up on for the difference in the Kahan cases, because those are ones where you do have previous information. You might have more of a closed question, yeah. whereas did Hillary, you know, own elephants in a dungeon or whatever? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, yep. Thank you. Uh, it's a slightly different question. I'm interested in how research is used in society. Uh, of course, diff very different research is more, more or less applicable, of course. Are there any examples of sectors in society or players in society that are more interested than others in your research? I could, I could myself could think about Twitter. I mean, from the from the yeah. results that you produced, other platforms, um, s the education sector, governments. Who's who's? Are you in affiliated with any of those? Um, are there any examples that you would mention? So uh, I will say that uh, social media, at least Facebook and Google, are interested enough to talk to us. Uh, but not interested enough to do anything, <laughs> <laughs> which which might be a high level of interest. I mean, as far as I can tell. But um, so you know, um, and uh, th um, yeah, there's people working in government that have uh, that w and we're doing some collaborative sort of work, but nothing in terms of like rolling out actual interventions. We we haven't broken that barrier yet. But I guess if we publish the paper, maybe we will be able to. That's the hope. But you know, probably. Already. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. We have two more questions. It's m let me just do a follow-up there. So, so the whole fact-checking business is problematic. We know that for the sort of reasons you gave and other people gave. Yeah. Uh, but a very simple thing might work, you're saying. Just adding, is this true? <laughs> yeah. Is this accurate? Yeah. That's all Facebook has to do. Yeah, well, you know, it'll have, it'll have some effects. It's not going to fix everything. No, but no, yeah, but it's yeah. a stop to think. Yeah, yeah. Is this true? Yeah, yeah. Of course, that would be a problem maybe for the true news. <laughs> I don't know. I mean yeah, but they can, so the th here's the thing about the intervention, just briefly, is that like, we, like I mentioned before, very crass version of that. It just it basically an existence proof for it working. Just sending a DM, which is this, uh, from a bot. It's a ridiculous thing. Um, but social media companies have information about the network, and so they can not only target specifically where they send the intervention, they can optimize it, you know, across a million different iterations. Uh, and see which ones work better or worse. And so, like, you know, scratching the surface of the possibilities. But, yeah. you know. Okay, two more questions. Yeah. Have right Hi, I'd just like to <laughs> know your views, because, like, you focus on the US context. Yeah. And, like, in some countries, it's not as, like, um, 
you know, defined if you're a Democrat or I mean, like in other sure. countries, it's a continuum yeah. on which political sphere you mm -hmm. are. So like, how would you, what are your thoughts on like the effects? And then the other is like in other um, contexts, it's also this fake news is like a whole political machinery mm -hmm. that's being produced and like it's trolls who mm -hmm. amplify them. So it's not really, I mean, like your experiment, they're paid. So they're forced to like sort of like give the politically correct answers. So, but like in the real world, it might not be reflective because yep. of the, you know, the realities. Yeah. A um, couple things. One thing is that, well, we still have the like evidence from actual tweeting. So that's one thing. But um, what was the first question again? Um, like in countries that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, yeah. So we did the same thing in uh, Italy, France, like that is that the actually motivation thing. Uh, Italy, France, and Canada, which are obviously very different politically. Um, the problem for doing these studies, and the reason why it helps in the States, and it's easier in the States, is that we can find more um, both pro-democratic and pro-republican headlines. When I did the study in Canada during the election, um, our recent federal election, I found one example of a false headline that was pro-liberal or pro-liberal li in the political sense, not the party sense. Um, all, everything else was pro-conservative, um, which makes it harder to assess these like motivated reasoning things. Uh, you can still assess the uh, impact of the intervention <coughs> and so on. Um, so that's one thing that's worth keeping in mind. Um, uh, and the other thing was, oh yeah, so then the, the other thing is that um, to generalize to the broad set of fake news depends on what context you're working in. And so our fake news pertains to American fake news. And so people who are in, uh, in more uh, societies where propaganda is more spread, uh, the, the type of fake news that people see is going to be different. And so we don't know how much this generalizes to that. And so that's just we work that needs to be done, basically. Yeah. Um, yes, I was just curious. Do you have um, any thoughts on whether or not you could make fake news, I mean, you're talking about different types of fake news, yeah. but how could you create fake news that's more targeted towards people that are more reflective? Could you do that? And mm. do you think people will do that? Um, it so would be more efficient if it was spread. I, I right, could show I you the figure, but maybe it would be, whatever. So to, uh, we, we determined what would predict whether the CRT is a positive predictor of people's judgments in the uh, truth of a headline or a negative predictor. And basically the answer is plausibility. So a headline that is obviously true is more highly correlated, judgments are more highly correlated with CRT for that, and which happens to be the case. Most true things are more obviously true than things that are false. Uh, things that are ambiguous, uh, that are people out of sample, or hard, it's harder for them to determine what's true or false, those are least correlated with CRT. Uh, and then things that are obviously not true are the most strongly, strongly not negatively correlated with CRT. Okay, and so if you, if you have a fake news headline that is really deceptive and hard to figure out what's true or false, it's people who are higher low CRT are not going to be as uh, predictive whether that's, uh, and, and which is really interesting, right, because it's not about difficulty, it's actually the opposite. You get a stronger correlation in the context where the headlines are not difficult to identify as being false because the people that are believing them are not thinking about them at all. And so just a little bit of thinking is sufficient to basically uh, have an effect. Thank you so much. Thank you.